Uh, another reason I'm speaking to you here is uh, presumably some of you are taking my earthquakes class on your kids. Anybody? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, <laughs> I promise not to use all of the same jokes, which they're not laughing at in class. Uh, but yeah. sort of the point. <laughs> um, okay. Um, and uh, so I do teach this uh, big, large enrollment, 250 student uh, general education class, which is really just it's called earthquakes, and it's designed to introduce. USC undergrads to some of the basic concept and it's a way to actually get some physics into the general education curriculum although I'm math phobic so um, I don't actually do any math which is a fairly popular decision I got through engineering calculus at Berkeley uh, due to the good graces of my then girlfriend who <laughs> helped me with my homework <laughs> okay um, so in uh, picture mute picture mute Joseph there we go there's one okay all right, hmm, that doesn't look right, does it? All right, um, we talk about a lot of things in this class, and uh, I just wanted to go through a couple quick slides. I'm going to go through things very quickly today. Uh, this is actually a picture in uh, Turkey uh, right after the devastating earthquake in 1999. It's their high speed rail line. You can see this spectacular 10 uh, foot offset to the right. It's the same kind of fault we have here in uh, the San Andreas in Southern California, called the North Anatolian Fault. Um, Another great reason I love doing this kind of stuff is you get to go cool places like Mongolia, which is the only place I've ever been that's underpopulated. And uh, they're you know, much slimmer back then, as you can tell. But this is uh, from a big earthquake in 1957, 30 feet of slip in a couple of seconds. So I mean, that's what got me excited about this, is sort of the energy and the power involved with earthquakes. And this is something I really try to convey to the undergrads. Uh, what's that? Mount Everest, OK, right. And uh, why is it there? What's the top? You see these layers up here? Those are limestone. The highest point on the Earth's surface is limestone. What's limestone made out of? Seashells. That used to be submarine. All right. It's there because of huge earthquakes. Um, but why did I show that slide? I can see where your kids got their senses of humor. Because it's there, all right? Which was said by George Mallory, who was, of course, the first person. There he is. Excuse me. There's Mallory. There's his assistant, who was not even a mountain climber. But he was the world's, he was a physics student, graduate student, and he was the world's leading expert in compressing oxygen. So that's why I brought him up there, which was probably a mistake because that didn't work out too well. Um, okay. All right. um, actually, this is what got me into uh, earthquake study. Well, actually, geology in the first place. I told uh, some of your kids who take the class that I was taking uh, my, my, I didn't know what to take. I was an undeclared major. And, Oh, I just on a whim, I took a geology class. And I, I just, uh, I had this wonderful British uh, teacher who, you know, was very had a very posh accent, and I just remember him during an introductory lecture talking about India's inexorable progress toward its eventual collision with Asia. And he just body checked himself into the wall, and I went, oh, "This is for me. That's it." So in that split second, I, I wanted to become a geologist. So of course, that's why Mount Everest over here is there, it's because India, Indian continental plate is colliding with the Asian continental plate here. And we have huge faults that are uplifting the Himalayas right here. <coughs> okay, in this class we also talk about sort of the association of Pacific Green with fire, the association of large earthquakes with volcanoes. We talk about why some volcanoes like this one in Hawaii just <coughs> spew out nice rainy lava, whereas others like this one in the Philippines explode and kill tens of thousands of people. And of course we also talk about tsunamis. Um, which are, as I'm sure you know, generated by very, very large earthquakes on these so-called subduction megathrust. This is in Hilo, Hawaii in 1946. That's the new sea level, temporarily. And this guy's standing on the pier. This guy was killed. Hilo was devastated. There's now a Pacific Early Warning System, which has been in effect uh, after this earthquake in 1960 or so, devastating with no warning, and that's proved to be very effective. And of course, we also talk about buildings, because that's where the rubber meets the road with earthquake studies is everything we're learning in this talk, and everything I'm going to talk about for the next 40 minutes really quickly, is designed to eventually get into the brains of engineers, structural engineers in particular, the people who build the buildings. Right? Because that's what matters. And remember, not, not <coughs> far be it for me to paraphrase the NRA, but remember, earthquakes don't kill people, buildings kill people. All right? It doesn't matter. I mean, you know, I, I aspire to be in a field somewhere with nothing over my head, and a big earthquake occurs, that would be so cool. <laughs> Flung off your feet in an earthquake, that'd be great. It's not so good if the building you're in is collapsing around your head. This is actually uh, in uh, northernmost Israel, up in the Golan Heights, and this is a medieval, uh, this is a crusader castle, actually. And it was in a big earthquake in 1202, 
and it started, this arch started to collapse and then stopped. So talk about buildings, you know, we talk about different kinds of building construction. This is in Chi Chi, Taiwan, earthquake, 1999. And uh, of course, you know, we, we talk about the really devastating impact that these can have when buildings actually do collapse. Again, this is in the, the 1999 Izmet, Turkey earthquake. You can see the North Anatolian Fault running right through there. You see this wall is offset about two meters. You see the road is offset about two meters, went right through the foundation of these buildings. These buildings are built basically the same code that a lot of buildings in Southern California are built to. So, I mean, there's nothing to be smug about. <laughs> there's definitely room for improvement. Okay, I really want to start off with the real basics, though, um, which is why we have, we really want to focus on earthquakes in, in California and what, we're, what we've been learning over the past few decades. And, but let's start with the basics, which is that earthquakes don't occur randomly. All right, this is an observation people have been making for decades. They occur in relatively narrow belts throughout the world. Of course, you can see the Pacific Ring of Fire here going through Japan, a little narrow belt down in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and there are these mid-ocean ridges, as they're called, which have earthquakes. So 90% of the Earth's you know, surface is not affected by earthquakes directly. It turns out that these belts of earthquakes, as I'm sure you all know, but define the edges, the boundaries of what are called large tectonic plates. Right? Now, these are typically anywhere from 50 to a couple hundred miles thick but relative to the diameter of the Earth, that's pretty thin, so these are sort of the scum on top of the, the globe, and these plates are constantly sliding around relative to one another. In some cases, they slide underneath one another, causes melting, which causes volcanoes. That's what the Pacific Ring of Fire is. All right, these are so-called subduction zones. They're the ones that generate the real big ones, the magnitude nines, which, fortunately, we don't have to worry about here in Southern California. All right, there are other places where the plates are pulling apart, example, this belt of earthquakes down in the middle of the uh, Atlantic Ocean, including Iceland. This is where places are splitting apart. North America and Europe are getting further apart at a rate of about two inches a year. And then there's a third type of plate boundary where the plates slide past each other horizontally. And that's what we've got here in Southern California, where the Pacific plate off to the west is sliding relatively northward relative to the North American plate along basically the San Andreas Fault. We'll talk more about that. So it doesn't take a lot of uh, imagination to see that all of the geological action recently is going along in Western North America, so lucky us. We're sitting here on this boundary between the Pacific Plate out here and the North American Plate <coughs> back in there. And here's sort of the situation we've got here. Uh, let's see. Here's the coastline. Here's the Gulf of California. This is Baja, the Baja Peninsula. Here's LA. There's San Francisco. There's Cape Mendocino and the Oregon border right about there, Seattle, Vancouver. So what we've got here is showing the San Andreas Fault right here, it's the dominant fault in California, is basically there connecting a place where we have oblique spreading. These little purple things are where we're creating new oceanic plate. And basically this is allowing, again, just move Baja right back in there. Baja is rifting away from mainland Mexico and moving north towards Alaska. Now, the San Andreas just connects these little spreading ridges with similar spreading ridges off northernmost California, where we're creating new oceanic lithosphere up there. So here's the situation. Here are these spreading ridges up what's called the Cascadia subduction zone, because you subduct under thrust uh, the new oceanic plate here. It causes melting, which comes to the surface as the Cascade volcanoes. And here we have the San Andreas, and here we have the spreading centers that are rifting Baja away from mainland Mexico. Now, um, basically, there are two major elements to the plate boundary in California. The first, and the most important, is the San Andreas Fault itself. I mean, there's a reason everyone's heard about it, so we'll talk more about that in detail. The second splits off from the San Andreas near Palm Springs and heads up along the east side of the Sierra Nevada, creating Owens Valley, Panamint Valley, Death Valley. All of these things are all major faults. That's collectively, those faults are called the Eastern California Shear Zone. Now, the motion, the rate of motion between the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate is about two inches a year. That's where all the energy for the earthquakes that we're worried about here in Southern California comes from. It's that motion of these two plates past one another. Believe it or not, the rocks actually are bending. It's just like bending a stick. And what do we do when we bend a stick? We're adding energy to the system. We're storing potential energy. It's like Sisyphus shoving a, shoving a boulder uphill. What's he doing? Adding energy to that. If he lets go, it's gonna roll downhill. What happens, though, if we keep bending the stick? Eventually, it's going to break. We've exceeded the strength of the material. In geological terms, that would be the strength that the rocks are held closed along a fault, and we have our earthquake. So that's where all this energy is coming from. 
is motion of the North America plate past the Pacific plate. Now, this is kind of a, an interesting image. Um, any of you have GPS in your car? Yeah, okay, well, geologists and, uh, or scientists use a, a very sophisticated version of exactly the same technology, which you all know what GPS is. It's a constellation is the term of a couple of dozen satellites put up originally by the U.S. Defense Department to guide cruise missiles, uh, which are now used for lots of civilian purposes as well. And one of the things they're used for is you can actually see plate tectonics in action. Extraordinary. Every one of these little arrows is a GPS receiver. All GPS satellites do is they send out microwave signals. And all the receivers do is they record the microwave signals. But by knowing the precise location of all of those satellites, and six or seven satellites at a time, you can get a precise distance. And if you know that, for literally now thousands of sites around the globe, you can see how these sites are moving relative to one another in real time from an external reference room. Absolutely unbelievable. It's almost like, for somebody who grew up before GPS, it's, it's like cheating. You can see this happening. It's absolutely amazing. So each one of these little arrows, you can't, there actually are arrows over here, you just can't see them. These are showing the tail of every arrow is a GPS site. One of these right here, I think that one is actually on the north side of campus. Uh, and these things look like six foot tall white plastic mushrooms. It's right across from the Burger King on Jefferson. And if you want to take a look. And what these are showing is the length of these arrows is showing you the rate that that point is moving relative to stable North America over there. So what we can see is, what you can't see here is there are a bunch of arrows here that basically aren't moving. This is effectively part of the North American plate out here in the eastern Mojave. But as we come across this eastern California shear zone, Palm Springs is right in here. Eastern California shear zone is running up like that. Here's LA. Here's the San Andreas right here. What you can see is that the length of the arrows gets much greater very suddenly. What we're seeing, is we're actually seeing that sites sort of in LA are moving at about 30 millimeters a year, almost an inch and a half a year, relative to one another. But earthquakes aren't occurring. So what's happening? This is the bending of the rocks that I'm talking about. All right, we're actually storing up energy by bending the crystal lattices of the rocks. It's weird to think of rocks bending. And they don't bend very much because they're really brittle and if you bend them a little bit, they're gonna break. But when you think about the volumes of rock, I mean, hundreds of kilometers in here and 10 miles thick, all right, just bending them a little bit, you can store up enormous energy. All of that energy is eventually gonna be released in earthquakes. Okay, so San Andreas, we've all heard of it. It's a good reason. It's by far the biggest fault in California. It and its kind of sister faults accommodate about 70% of the motion between the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate. So it is the <coughs> dominant feature within this plate boundary. <coughs> it stores up energy faster than any other fault, therefore it releases energy faster than any other fault, generates the biggest earthquakes the most frequently. So it's, there's a reason it's well known. In fact, it has generated the two largest earthquakes we've seen historically. The uh, 1857 earthquake, which started up here near a small town in Cal Central California called Parkfield, ruptured down. The grapevine is right there, here's LA, to about San Bernardino. Any of your kids tell you the original city motto for San Bernardino, which is sandwiched between the main San Andreas Fault and its biggest splay, the San Jacinto Fault? San Bernardino, city on the move? Okay, no, they, they changed the city motto. Okay, this was about a magnitude eight. I have no pictures of that. However, I do have some great pictures of 1906, which was also about a magnitude eight. Devastated San Francisco, but not as much as if the earthquake had started somewhere else. It started right here, if it started up there, San Francisco would have been even flattened even more than it was. Okay, here's a picture of the major faults in the Bay Area, here's San Francisco proper. The San Francisco earthquake in 1906 started right there. If it had started up here, we would have had an effect called source directivity, which sends energy preferentially in one direction or another. Since it started here, as close to the city as you can get on the San Andreas Fault, we had no source directivity, which means that the shaking was much lower. In Northridge, for example, there was incredible source directivity. Earthquake started down at 20 kilometers depth, ruptured up towards the surface. Just intuitively, it makes sense that the energy is going to go that way. You did not need to have the roller coasters on at Magic Mountain to get quite a ride at 4.31 in the morning for Northridge, because the energy went northwards, directly away from LA. We got lucky in that one. All right. So here's the San Andreas Fault running through the Santa Cruz Mountains. There's the major splay, the Hayward Fault running through the East Bay. Uh, Cal's uh, Stadium is right there. 
Uh, I'm going to show you a picture. It goes right underneath the stadium. Uh, I'll show you a picture uh, from right there. I'll show you another picture from right there. And I'll show you another picture. This is not really, has nothing to do with the football game last Saturday, but I'm going to show you a picture from Stanford, too. Okay. Uh, my favorite earthquake picture of all time. All right. Um, this is Stanford. This is on the quad, the morning after the 1906 earthquake. And this is a statue of Louis Agassiz. Who was, anyone know who he was? He was a famous educator and naturalist. He was actually an early geologist, really, from the mid-18th century, Swiss, uh, who did a lot of work on ice ages. And uh, his statue was up there on top of the quad, and of course it toppled at the earthquake. And one of the octogenarian Professor Emeriti at Stanford apparently came out the next morning with his, his uh, coterie of students and came up and looked at the statue, and he'd known Agassiz when he was a young man. And he came up, and this is the greatest, if it's true, it might be apocryphal, but he came up and he said, Ah, yes, poor Agassiz. He always was better in the abstract than in the concrete. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, any of you, you're older than your, your children, so, yeah, you would be, right? Um, so, have any of you ever mucked out a stable? Because I'm not sure they have. Okay, yes, not fun, right? Okay, what do you do? You have to get the manure out of the stable, which means you, you know, get it out through a door or a window. There's the window. There's the stain of the manure pile. Where's the manure pile? Right there. Where's the San Andreas Fault? Right there. This is an offset manure pile. I love this picture. This is great. Okay, because A, it's got manure in it, which, you know, kids love. Um, they're your kids, they're not mine. Um, and the other thing I really love about this picture is it gives you, you can, you can spend 20 minutes just teaching about earthquakes on this picture. First of all, it gives you an idea. This is Marin County, north of San Francisco. It gives you a, an idea of how much displacement can occur in a big earthquake, magnitude 8. It's like 20 feet of displacement here in a few seconds. The other thing, and perhaps most importantly, is what is that building? It's a barn, right? Yes. Uh, the, the obvious answer is, this is what I keep telling you kids, the obvious answer is usually the right one. Okay, it's a barn. Wood frame construction. It turns out serendipitously that wood frame construction is amazingly, it's an amazingly effective earthquake resistant design. It's a very, very rigid box. All right, it's hard. Have you ever, any, anyone ever watched a wood frame, like single family house being torn down? Big clamshell bucket. You can take the entire middle out of a house and the other, the two ends are fine. These things are impossible to knock down because it's such a rigid construction format. Wonderfully earthquake resistant. As long as wood frame buildings are tied to their foundations, they do great in earthquakes. The stuff inside, not so good, unless it's anchored too. But look at this. This is a magnitude eight earthquake. It's probably the biggest that we can have in this part of California. 20 feet of displacement along the foundation line. It knocked a board loose. <laughs> All right, great earthquake resistant design. Um, wonderful. Here's this, this is uh, Tamales Bay back here. San Andreas is a couple hundred feet uh, away, parallel to the railroad tracks here. The train was ready to leave the station. I, I was just using this slide on Thursday, um, talking about how different waves generated by earthquakes. The ones that cause most of the damage are called shear waves. And they propagate like a snake, they go like this. So as the rupture started down near their San Francisco, we're looking north, propagated this way, the shear waves were coming to the north. Now, locomotive, the engineer was in the locomotive. He, the first motion here, the shear wave as it came through, felt the, the first waves, which don't do a lot of damage, called P waves, primary pressure waves. They move the fastest. He felt it, realized there was an earthquake, and, you know, started to panic the way most people do. And the first, then later, the secondary waves, the ones that travel like a snake, all right, the ones that cause, that carry all the real energy, the first motion of that was this way. It pulled the ground towards the fault. Well, you move my elbow that way, which way is the locomotive going to tip over? going to tip over that way, right? So what did he do? You don't want to, like, be in a locomotive cab, steam locomotive, steam pipes break, he gets called it to death, which is that. Um, so what did he do? He wanted to get out of the cab. Locomotive started to tip over that way. He ran to the side of the cab. Fortunately, he wasn't fast enough because the return pulse was even stronger. It just flipped the locomotive back like that. So he was in the cab. He was okay. It's no steam pipes broke. But amazing, you know, enormous energy released in these bigger plates. Um, okay. I wanted to show you some simulations done uh, as part of a, a SCAC and USGS effort, uh, US geological effort to understand these things. This is a simulation of... Uh, the 1906 earthquake starting here right next to San Francisco. Again, that was a good thing. What we're looking at is we're looking at um, shaking intensity, basically. How Sean, look at this. 
there's this pulse of the shear wave right there, just knocked the locomotive over. All right, this pulse of energy propagating down the fault. These are the things that knock down buildings, these so-called shear wave pulses. All right, the next one, frankly, I find this one a little unnerving <laughs> as it's pointed at you. Okay, we're up north of Marin. The locomotive shot I showed you there, the barn shot is right there. Stanford's down there. Here's San Francisco. The earthquake's going to nucleate right there, and it's going to come right towards you. I want to emphasize something. 1,000 times exaggeration. All right. Just, just, this is just for illustrative purpose. Oops, wrong button. This gives you an idea of just how intense some of these strong ground motions can be. This makes me queasy even looking at it. Okay, locomotive tipped over. Look at that pulse of energy. This is that shear wave pulse. All right. Yeah. <laughs> That one unnerves me. Um, a lot of people don't know this. Anybody from North Bay area, Santa Rosa area, anybody? Okay, all right, well, Santa Rosa, a lot of people don't know this, but Santa Rosa got hammered actually by the earthquake worse than San Francisco did. And that's because the earthquake nucleated way down there by San Francisco. So we did have time to get source to your activity here. This is a major effect. Coupled with that is the fact that it's sitting on what's called a sedimentary basin full of sand and gravel. These, these sedimentary basins amplify shaking, as we're going to see. Okay, there's that shear wave pulse of energy. But watch what happens in here. See, look at this. It's yellow, 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 yellow. Look at this. Now, all of a sudden, we're going to start seeing amplification. All right? This is because there's a sedimentary basin right there. And look at how much stronger the shaking is in here than it is even closer to the earthquake. All right? Um, we're sitting on a sedimentary basin in LA. LA is built on top of a much, much bigger version of these things. These things turn out to be extremely important in controlling where the ground is going to shake. Um, this talk is not meant to be frightening, it's meant to be enlightening. But, uh, that's why I'm showing stuff up in the Bay Area, which is where I, I grew up. I grew up over there um, in Pleasant Hill, which turns out neither to be pleasant nor a hill. <laughs> All right, so. Uh, it's better now. <coughs> Back when I grew up, it was like a, a casting call for a Greece revival. <laughs> okay, here's the 1906 earthquake, there's the 1857 earthquake. Notice that the southern San Andreas hasn't broken since in at least 300 years. This is the part of the fault that everyone keeps talking about, I think somewhat irresponsibly in my view, as 10 months pregnant or overdue. Earthquakes don't behave like clockwork. We do not know where the next big earthquake on the southern San Andreas is going to occur. It could occur on the southernmost San Andreas, over here by Palm Springs. Then again, 1857 could re-rupture. Could be some combination of the two, all right? And in fact, a lot of my research focuses on the faults closer to home, which aren't going to generate earthquakes as big as the San Andreas, but they're so much closer, location, 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 that they're going to cause at least as much damage. Quick, where's the nearest fault to you right now? Uh, actually, three kilometers, two miles that way. All right. All right, so 70% of the motion is on the San Andreas, and uh, the plate motion is on the San Andreas and its various displays. The other 20% of the motion, most of the rest, 20 to 25% of the motion, goes up, again, peels off near Palm Springs and goes up through the Mojave on a various bunch of faults and goes up along the east side of the Sierra Nevada, so-called Eastern California Shear Zone. You can see, uh, here's the Salton Sea, there's Palm Springs, so running up along here uh, and uh, basically along the east side of the Sierra Nevada, you see some forest fires here up in the Sierra. Uh, Death Valley, Panamint Valley, and across the Mojave through here. Now, all right, sorry, just another picture. Here's the Sierra Nevada, Great Valley, there's the Bay Area. Uh, hard to see, it's a U2 photo, but basically we're looking up along the, here's Mono Lake, the east side of the Sierra Nevada. All of these, these uh, canyons and ridges out here are controlled by faults in the Eastern California Shear Zone. Uh, one of the most spectacular views in the world, this is standing at Owens Lake, looking up at Mount Whitney, which is right there. 10,000 feet of vertical relief, just spectacular. Now, there's a big fault which ruptured in a large earthquake in 1872, which we'll talk a little bit about, running right through there. There's another fault along the basins here in Nevada. This is all part of the Eastern California Shear Zone. Turns out these faults, particularly in the Mojave, have been having a lot of earthquakes over the past, well, historically. But when we go back and look back in time, doing what, the kind of stuff I do, which is where we dig trenches across faults, I'll show you some pictures, to try to figure out where ancient earthquakes occurred. Turns out that the Eastern California Shear Zone has been really active. I mean, uh, any of you remember the 92 earthquake? It was felt pretty strongly in LA. 
This was a 7.3. You can see this beautiful offset of the road out uh, in Landers. And it, that was just one of uh, a series of earthquakes. There was 1999, Hector Mine. This was a 7.1. Uh, here's the surface rupture of the earthquake going across. Uh, this occurred out on the, the Marine Corps live fire base at 29 Palms. We all had to get permission to go out there to map the ruptures, and you get all kinds of cool signs. You get to wear flak jackets and helmets, and uh, some of them got delivered in helicopters, some of the geologists. There were bombs all over the place, um, so we had to take ordnance training. And the rather intense young man who was delivering the ordnance training came out and said something like, DON'T TOUCH ANYTHING! <laughs> the phrase he used that I absolutely loved was, yeah, if you touch anything, you'll turn into a pink mist. <laughs> Very evocative, so we didn't touch anything. So, and you know, but, you know, earthquakes, you know, sometimes cause these big chasms, and some really, really, I don't know, stupid people. Um, <laughs> don't, don't tell my wife. Um, you know, and you get all kinds of cool images like this. And, um, yeah. so, uh, these earthquakes um, have been occurring with, with relative, you know, frequency. These are, and there were a number of earthquakes back in the 40s and 50s, too smaller. So the Mojave's been active. And when you go upstream, farther north along the eastern California shores, and we had this very large 1872 earthquake, which devastated Lone Pine and all the towns you drive up through on 395, because you're basically driving along the fault right through there. Um, this earthquake occurred out here in the eastern California shores, and nobody's quite sure how big this was before seismographs. It was at least a 7.6 or a 7.7. <coughs> and that doesn't sound like much, but the difference between a 7.7 and a 7.9 is a factor of twice in energy. Really logarithmic scale. You've all heard about, oh, well, you know, it goes up by a factor of 10. Actually, when you look at energy, which is what most modern seismologists do, it goes up by a factor of 32. All right, so magnitude 7 releases 32 times more energy than 6. Magnitude 8 releases 32 times more energy than 7. 32 times 32, about 1,000. That's close enough for me. So magnitude 8, these 1906, uh, 1857 kind of things, maybe 1872 hundreds of times to maybe a thousand times more energy than something like the 1987 Whittier and Harris earthquake magnitude 6. So those little quibbling numbers mean a lot. All right, um, when I want to focus in a little more uh, closer to home because these are, uh, I do a lot of work all over the world. I, I spend a lot of time working in Turkey, but I also do a lot of work uh, in and more importantly underneath LA because uh, I, for the past 15 years I've been trying to understand the hazard from the faults literally in the case of this thing right underneath our feet. Um, this is great. I mean, it's, this is the Pointy Hills thrust we're talking about. I'll show you pictures of it in a minute. And it's, it's right underneath my office here, and it's the bottom of it's right underneath my house in, in South Pasadena. So I can't, I drive across this thing twice every day. Okay, so here's the San Andreas Fault out here. Here's the PV Peninsula. There's Santa Monica going down. San Juan Capistrano's down there. Uh, here are the San Gabriel Mountains, uh, which are being uplifted along a big fault. I'll show you a picture of it in a minute. Um, and what you can see are blue arrows here. These are, again, GPS vectors. And here we've removed the effect of storing up energy along the San Andreas Fault. What we're just looking at here is we're looking at how these stations up in the San Gabriel Mountains and over, over towards Santa Susana are moving relative to Catalina Island out here. And there are stations out here, you just can't see them because the vectors are so short. PD Peninsula, really short. Uh, there's USC, short. But then notice they get really long by the time you get up to here. What this means is that in this zone between where we are right now and sort of the mountain front up at the north end of the San Gabriel Valley and going across up through the San Fernando Valley, there's a zone of about seven or eight miles width where we are compressing LA from north to south. We're squeezing LA. What does that mean? We're squeezing the rocks. It means we're bending them. We're distorting the crystal lattices. We're storing up energy. This is where all the energy that's going to come in our future earthquakes is coming from. JPL up at the mountain front, Altadena, is getting closer to USC at a rate of about five millimeters a year, one fifth of an inch a year. But there's no earthquakes. We're just squeezing the rocks. We're just bending it, just like bending a stick. You're adding energy to the system. Eventually, it's going to be released. So it's the faults that are going to release this energy that I do a lot of times. This is a really cool animation showing what's called the community fault model generated by the earthquake center. And what you can see is just some of the more than 300 active faults we have underneath Southern California. Um, again, here's the coastline. There's Catalina. Uh, there's Lompoc out here, Santa Barbara. Santa Monica's in here. We're sitting right there. There's the PV Peninsula. The big red thing is the San Andreas. We'll zoom out on it. 
you can see that this is an incredibly complicated place. Um, let me just let's let this thing cycle through because it'll highlight the San Andreas, and then it's going to highlight this blue thing, which is the Pony Hills thrust, which is right down there. This is an amazing undertaking. Nothing like this has ever been done by anyone else, any other organization around the world. Here's, here's the Pony Hills thrust, this thing that is lurking underneath the city. We're going to talk a little more about this, and I want you to keep your eyes right there. You can see that this thing is quite large, and that it underlies <coughs> most of the northern part of metropolitan LA. There we go. Okay. So you can see where this thing is. It basically goes all the way up, almost up to the mountain front, underlies most of northern Los Angeles. Now, why are we why do we even have faults underneath LA? We've got the, the San Andreas taking up most of the plate boundary motion and the fault turning up along <coughs> eastern Sierra Nevada, taking up most of the rest. Well, you can really see it in this image. In most of California, sort of from, the, the grapevine is, is right in here, so from over sort of west of Bakersfield, all the way up 200 miles north of San Francisco, the San Andreas is pretty straight. It's really foreshortened in this view. This is a U2 uh, photograph uh, looking north uh, from the Gulf of California down here over, over Baja. Um, now up here, the motion of the Pacific Plate past the North America Plate is almost parallel to the San Andreas. The San Andreas is just a vertical crack. So these things are sliding past each other really efficiently. But obviously, if the relative plate motion is, that arrow's a little off, it's actually more like that. Look at this. See this big bend in the San Andreas? Geologists have uh, really creatively named this the big bend <laughs> of the San Andreas. And you can see that there's convergence across the San Andreas, because the plate motion is not parallel to the fault. These blocks aren't just sliding past each other anymore, they're running into each other. What does that do? That creates all the mountains of Southern California. All of these east-west mountain ranges, the so-called transverse ranges, all of these things are being built by big, what we call thrust faults. Just shown schematically here, the teeth point down the dip of the fault. This is the San Gabriel Mountains right down here. We're looking at one of the big faults. We're looking at that thing, in fact. This is Cucamonga Peak, the east end of the San Gabriel Mountains. Um, this is a big it's not a quarry, this is a trench. This is the kind of stuff I do for a living. I, I play in the dirt. Um, I'll show you a sec in a second, but what we have here is we have evidence for about three earthquakes in the past 7,000 years, thrusting this part up over this part, and over millennia, we're generating San Gabriel Mountains. Here you can see the same picture. You see this narrow little soil up here, this dark soil. You see suddenly it gets much, much thicker here. This is because this has been thrust up over that so this is how these mountains grow in earthquakes like these. All right. Now, by collecting little tiny chunks of charcoal that have been washed in from ancient forest fires, we can carbon-14 date these things. If we see a layer that's been broken by the fault, get an age on that. A younger layer that has not been broken by the fault, we can say, hey, an earthquake occurred between deposition of that layer and that layer. If we know their ages, we can bracket the age of the earthquake. By seeing how much it slipped, that's a good proxy for size, because the bigger the earthquake, the more slip there is. So we can get an idea of where earthquakes have occurred in the past and how large they were. This is called paleoseismology. Uh, anyone recognize that? Yeah. Where's that? Santa Monica. That's out by the state school. Yeah. Um, yeah. Westwood. Yeah. Um, the state college out there. Um, this next time, if you ever drive along Santa Monica, we're, we're on Overland and we're looking at uh, this is Santa Monica Boulevard right here, which is built. Uh, well, and this is a beautiful lawn. This is one of the most beautifully landscaped fault scarps in the world. Um, it's the Santa Monica scarp. The other really beautiful one is Huntington Gardens. Any of you ever been to Huntington Gardens? Yeah, that's the fault scarp of the eastward continuation of this thing uh, called the Raymond Fault. Uh, Santa Monica Boulevard has some curves through here. That's because it was built as a trolley line along the base of the fault scarp. So you can actually see these things. You can see the faults where they are, even though there's a city on top of them. But if your, your eye is tuned to this, faults leave sort of a characteristic signature in, in, in the landscape. If you know what to look for, you can actually map these things in great detail. It's something I did about 15 years ago was map these faults out. Uh, we dig trenches across these things. This is uh, across the Santa Monica Fault. There's buildings along Wilshire in the background. Uh, this is the scarp here, the Red Cross West LA Disaster Headquarters. It's right there, built on top of the scarp. It seems to be human nature to build on top of fault scarps. Um, where are we? Hollywood and Vine. There's part of the Hollywood sign. Looking up Vine Street. Capitol Records building. Um, for you young people, records are these round things that <laughs> <laughs> music on. 
Um, and let's see, hmm, there's a hill there. Why would I be showing you a picture of a hill? You have three choices when you see a hill in Southern California. Either it's man-made, or it's the edge of an old river channel, or it's a fault or a fault scarf. In this case, that's the Hollywood Fault. It runs parallel to Hollywood Boulevard all the way through downtown. All three of these faults we've just been talking about, the Raymond Fault, which is Huntington Gardens, the Hollywood Fault right here, the Santa Monica Fault I was just talking about, they're the same fault, uh, just have different names. So you can see these things. We dig trenches across these things. This is in San Marino, uh, in the median strip of Sierra Madre Boulevard. We dug a trench across it a few years ago. And this is the eastern end of that system, the Raymond Fault. That is the Raymond Fault, actually. But it's really hard to see these things. So what we do is we grid them up, just like an archaeological ex excavation. And then we photograph each square meter. And then we tile them together in the computer. And you get things like this, beautiful images. You can see this black layer right here, beautifully offset by a little secondary reverse fault. Here it is down here. That goes up to there. Offset about a meter and a half. Each one of these is 50 centimeters. That's 100 centimeters, one meter. Your eyes drawn to this. Really cool. Fantastic. That's neat. Doesn't mean anything. All of the action is right there. That is the Raymond Fault. That little crack. These things are incredibly unimpressive when you look at them. Here's the Raymond Fault. This is a big fault. This is it. It's just a crack. It's juxtaposing this gravel against this mud. And you know, this can get kind of tedious when you're sitting in a trench for a month mapping this stuff in great detail and collecting all these little samples. But when you think about what you're doing and you're thinking about the energy that was required and released to generate these kind of things, it keeps it quite exciting. So this is just an image of some of the major faults we have here around Southern California. LA's built at a really interesting place. To the north of us here and underneath us, we have all of these east-west trending thrust faults. To the south of us, we have all of these San Andreas parallel what are called strike slip faults. Now, just because these are, what I've done here is I've just projected the, the part of the fault plane that will break in earthquakes up onto a horizontal map surface. So the big blobs just mean the fault is gently dipping. Uh, a vert if you think about the horizontal projection of a vertical fault, it's just a line. So the San Andreas, the biggest fault here, just looks like a line. So just to give you an idea of what we're looking at. Each of these black blobs is the area that ruptured in some historic earthquakes. That's how much fault it takes to rupture to generate the Northridge earthquake. Uh, 1971 earthquake, also about magnitude 6.7. 1933 Long Beach earthquake down here, misnamed because it actually occurred down by Newport, uh, Newport Beach. Um, magnitude 5 is tiny, magnitude 6, magnitude 6.7. So the size of the fault scales with the size of the earthquake. The more fault slips, the bigger the earthquake. Now, um, that big fault that's generating the San Gabriel Mountains comes to the surface right here at the north end of the image. But I, I show this image for two reasons. One, when we focus on buildings, which we're probably not going to have a chance to talk about today, we tend to focus on the high rises. And there are concerns about the high rises and how these things are going to behave when most all of the ones built in here were built before we even knew that that thing existed and could generate, based on some research that we've been doing, could generate magnitude seven and a half earthquakes. Uh, you don't mention that in the engineers, one of whom came up to me after a talk I was asked to give at the National uh, Convention of the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute. And he came up to me after the talk, and he was so apoplectically angry that I would even mention this fault that it was the only time in my professional career where I was, I was having this conversation with this guy, trying to be as calm as possible, and thinking, if he hits me, I'm hitting him back. <laughs> <laughs> Just because there's so much money and so much, you know, kind of professional ego tied up in these things that a lot, of, a lot of the engineers don't want to hear it. But the other thing I wanted to point out is we're basically, this shot is basically from directly up here. Everything we can see up to the base of the mountains is above the Pointy Hills Thrust. And all the way over to Beverly Hills and all the way east of Fullerton, all right, for that width is above this thing. We have a certain kind of fault that's quite common in LA. These are called blind thrust faults. It's an old archaic oil company term we inherited, blind, because these faults don't reach the surface. They don't see the surface. Unlike faults like the San Andreas and all the pictures I've been showing you of that, like that trench, all those trenches, those faults come to the surface. These blind thrust faults don't. They terminate upwards, in this case, about two miles depth, never get shallower than that. And above that depth, there's no fault slip. Instead, we have folding. We develop these big folds. Believe it or not, USC is on a top of a huge fold. We can't see it because it's constantly being buried by sand and gravel delivered by the LA River until the Army Corps of Engineers got it home. Okay, uh, I have to, I'm running out of time, but I gotta tell you about this picture. All right, this is, I took this from a helicopter in the morning in the Northridge earthquake, and this is up in the valley, and um, this is a broken uh, 
gas main here and a broken water main up here. Now, the moral of the story is, if you go out at 4.31 in the morning, awakened by the earthquake, to check on your new truck, and you smell gas, remember that the important part of the phrase ignition switch is ignite, because this is where he landed. He was parked right there. And uh, he blew up the gas main and burned down his house and all his neighbor's houses. And he walked away. He had burns on his hands, but he was chagrined. Um, okay, we've been studying all of these faults, trying to understand, my particular research interest lately is trying to understand how faults interact with and communicate with each other over very long time scales and very long distance scales. How all these earthquakes that they're generating tie into sort of a coherent whole. Because basically all these faults are acting to do the same thing. They're all there to accommodate the Pacific moving past the North American plate. They're all doing the same thing, so they should act in concert with one another. So I'm trying to understand these patterns. Um, trying to understand the blind thrust, um, there's the Pointy Hills thrust superimposed on an image of LA, has been particularly difficult. Here's this thing lurking underneath downtown. You can see it's sort of extent in the green. It, a little piece of this generated the 1987 Whittier and Arrows earthquake. You can see this big fold above it. You can see the fault doesn't get any shallower than three kilometers or about two miles. Studying these things has been pretty difficult, and some people are a little more pessimistic than others about the hazard that these things pose. Uh, so we, we have a variety of means of studying these things. We're not killing gophers here. We're sending sound energy down into the ground. I put that joke up on my website, and I actually had some guy call me up and said, oh, really interesting stuff, but I was actually more interested in your gopher uh, eradication. <laughs> it's the web giveth and the web taketh away. Um, all right. We benefit from having 100 years of oil exploration in LA. It's a huge oil export, exporting region. And these folds trap oil. So the petroleum industry for decades was trying to map out these folds in the subsurface. Since they're not really interested anymore, since they've taken out most of the oil, they're letting academia have these data. And it's just an enormous treasure trove of information. You can actually see highlighted in red, this is an image by my, my buddy John Shaw at Harvard, uh, you can actually see the fault plane, sound energy being bounced down and recording it up at the surface. And you can also see this big fold. What we've been doing is, you know, as you saw on the previous slide, is going in and trying to figure out the nitty gritty details of the folding to try to, you know, in the upper few hundred meters, and to try to understand the history of earthquakes on these things, to do paleo seismology of line thrust, like anybody had done before. So you can see that this little box is this box, and you can still see the folding persisting up to about 100 meters depth. And that little box is this little box. Go out and we hit the ground every meter with a sledgehammer, which is really, really, really silly looking. Uh, and you can see the fold extending all the way up into the surface. And then we actually go in with boreholes, go down in here and collect cores, and sometimes actually go down in them. Uh, anyone recognize that? Uh, this is Ozzie and Harriet Nelson's house, which is a real house. It was sort of the progenitor of reality television in the 50s. And they actually lived in this house. They were a real family uh, doing scripted stuff in their real house. Very strange. Uh, sort of the archetype of the 50s nuclear family, which may need some revision uh, in terms of stability because the Hollywood fault is underneath their living room. Um, yeah, so sometimes you go down in these things. Friends think I'm nuts for doing this, but I don't mind small space. It's kind of cool. Um, well, on a bit more sobering note, <laughs> no, I mean, this, you worry, these are. A big earthquake in LA would be really bad. Um, to give you an idea, one of the things Skek has been doing is, is really trying to get the information, all of this information I'm talking about, into usable form for the engineers, who were the ones that really matter, because they have to build the buildings that are going to withstand this stuff, whether they want to hear about it or not. This is a simulation by my friend Rob Graves, who's, um, let's see, uh, I think my son and his daughter have been sort of unofficially affianced since they were about nine months old, <laughs> according to them. Um, this is a simulation of a big earthquake on the Pointy Hills Thrust. Now, don't freak out about this. What you're going to see is what look like waves going across the basin. This is just a simulation technique to show you how fast the ground is going to be moving horizontally. All right, we're going to watch. We're going to have an earthquake start. Uh, that's the Raymond Fault underneath Pasadena here. And we're going to see this energy propagate out and be accentuated by the Los Angeles Basin. Look at that huge pulse of energy. All right, this is getting enhanced because this is like a big bathtub right here filled with 30,000 feet of sand and gravel that have been eroded off the San Gabriel Mountains. You see how we have these huge pulses of energy. These are these shear wave pulses. And later, we have surface wave energy 
getting into the act here. Um, it's it's a challenging place to have built a city uh, in terms of earthquakes. Um, but we are learning an enormous amount. I mean, thinking about prediction, we don't know how to predict when. We've done an amazing job of predicting where, what's going to happen, how frequently it's likely to occur, and exactly how strong the ground is going to shake at any given point. So in that sense, prediction has really been effective. Uh, I want to leave you with a really, I'm, I'm out of time, so I'm going to go through this very quickly. This is San Gabriel Mission, oldest masonry building in California. It's been there since the 1780s. It has not fallen down, which means we don't have a big, haven't had a big earthquake on any of these LA region faults in that time. Um, we do know we've had small earthquakes because the, the mission fathers were very nice about building uh, paleo seismometers. They called them bell towers, but they fell down <laughs> every earthquake, so we have a good record of when they fell down. So no earthquakes, and this is basically a generic observation. The entire historic period, in terms of not the San Andreas, and certainly not the Eastern California shoes on, but the, the faults underneath our feet, this urban fault network, um, has generated very few large earthquakes, no big ones, and not even really any moderately large ones. Northridge is probably the biggest earthquake that's occurred on this fault network during historic time. When we put all this paleo seismologic information together that my group and my students and a lot of other people have been doing, what we see here is we get something like this. This is time going back from the present to 12,000 years ago. Uh, this is energy release in earthquakes, and each one of these colored blobs is a paleo seismic seismically defined earthquake. The bigger the blob, the bigger the earthquake, the more energy released. The width of these blobs defines the errors in age dating, which are, tend to be sloppy. But what your eye is immediately drawn to is that energy release in earthquakes is not constant on this fault network. Very episodic. Nothing has been going on for the past thousand years, so that the his entire historic period, you know, just from historic data, we know that the past 200 years has been quiet. But we can go back a thousand years, at least, maybe even 1,500 years, and these faults underneath LA have been relatively quiet. Contra you know, contrast, there was a big pulse of energy in which four or five different faults broke in large magnitude earthquakes about 1,500 to 2,000 years ago, and so on. You see these pulses going back in time. Now, I got through saying before that the Eastern California shear zone has been active. When other people have done the same thing out there and looked at those faults, what you get is you get the blue blobs. The pink is what I just showed you in the previous slide for LA and your eyes should be drawn to this apparent anti-correlation. When that's on and generating a lot of earthquakes, LA appears to be relatively quiet. We've been in quiet mode for the past thousand years. They've been in going crazy mode for the past thousand years, and it's still ongoing. Landers, Hector Mine. Well, this sent us searching for an explanation for this, and um, basically what we think is going on is that you can divide the fault network in Southern California into two big systems of faults. One of them is the entire San Andreas plus all these faults in LA we've been talking about, plus a fault we haven't talked about called the Garlock. All right. These are there to accommodate motion through the Big Bend and do all the extra work that's required. The other fault network is the southern part of the San Andreas and Eastern California Shear Zone, which is effectively trying to sort of short circuit all of this mess. Remember, I mean, one of my favorite aphorisms is uh, nature is very much like a 14-year-old boy, sloppy and lazy. All right. In this case, nature's lazy. It doesn't want to do all this extra work of going around the big bend and moving the garlock and moving all these faults underneath us. It would rather just have a nice straight shot. This is the most mechanically efficient way that it can move the plates past each other. So we think these two systems sort of toggle on and off. And when you look at the behavior of the San Andreas, even though it's still generating big earthquakes fairly frequently, it has been doing so less frequently over the past thousand years. So it really, and when you look at the Garlock, it's only generated one earthquake in the past thousand years. In that cluster of earthquakes in LA 2,000 years ago, there were three earthquakes in the Garlock. So it really looks like this system is in slow mode. It's not in off mode. I mean, we could have a big earthquake on the San Andreas tomorrow, or a big earthquake on the Pony Hills Trust tomorrow. But right now, this looks like it's in more active mode. So um, I'm out of time. I was going to talk about buildings, but I'm not going to have time. So let me just uh, leave you with this. Some of this is kind of sobering. All right, I think any information, my whole philosophy of doing this kind of stuff is that any information we can gain about the hazard facing us, the risk facing LA in particular, is good news. I mean, you want to know what the threat is. You want to evaluate the threat so you can mitigate it. I mean, it, it's senseless to just ignore it and put your head in the sand, because it's going to happen anyway. There's nothing we can do about the earthquakes. Right? They're going to happen. It's incumbent upon us to figure out how to deal with them. But having said that, I need to leave you with this. Uh, the bad news first, this is from National Geographic about six months ago, your odds of dying are 100%. <laughs> All right, but this lists how you're likely to die. And um, 
you can see the biggies, heart disease, cancer, stroke, motor vehicle accident, suicide, falling, um, firearm assault, pedestrian accident, drowning, motorcycle accident. We're down to one in a thousand, so a tenth of a percent of dying in a motorcycle accident. Fire, smoke, bicycling accident. All right, we're down to even slower than that. Air, space accident, accidental firearm discharge, uh, see suicide, mm -hmm. uh, accidental electrocution, alcohol poisoning, hot weather, hornet, wasp, or bee sting, legal execution, lightning, <laughs> and then we get to earthquakes. Your odds of dying in an earthquake are 1 in 117,000. So let me leave you with that. Thanks very much. <laughs>